Coming up in just under two minutes, it's episode number 25 featuring Laredo's own singer-songwriter, William Beckman. To learn more about Jack and today's guest, check out the YouTube description below for their bios and website links. Also included are audio links to listen on your favorite audio platform and a link to visit jackandaroundshow.com where you will find the upcoming release schedule and catalog of episodes. Before we toss it to Jack, here's a one minute preview of today's episode followed by a quick word from Jack on the behalf of our sponsor, Lone Star Dragons. When did you start writing songs? In high school. And that was when Radney really kind of came into the picture. I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't even think of, uh, I was playing George Strait songs and Tom Petty songs and we were. I love that juxtaposition. <laughs> what kind of music you play? Well, it's like George Strait meets Tom Petty. I got a degree in music business. I had friends of mine that were having other majors and people were studying commercial voice, you know, we're getting a degree in songwriting. What a major to have, right? <laughs> My dude, if you... <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, God bless those people. I'm sure, I'm sure they're doing fine. I hope so. But it, it's that. that <laughs> no, you don't. I tell my, my band, I said, man, I don't care how shitty of a day you're having. Our job to smile and to put on the best performance that you possibly can. I have no idea. You've got no idea who's out there and where they came from or why they're there. Or, and they spent their hard earned money on it, man. Before social media, what were the differences between then and now? Because I'm curious if, if I'm right or wrong. You're, or ex you're exactly right. And it's hard for guys guys like me because man i still i don't care what mick jagger had for breakfast <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't want to know the who you know that he ha has spotted underwear presented by lone star dry goods curated collection of handcrafted quality goods the truly unique americana vibe visit lone star dry goods in person right here at the world headquarters in historic downtown abilene texas just west of fort worth in willow park we're online at LoneStarDryGoods.com. What's up, man? Nothing. How you been, brother? Good to see you. Good to see you. You look good. What you been up to? Just working. Trying to make a living. How is it working, man? It's good. Sure, sure as hell beats last year and the year before that. <laughs> what, kind of gigs, what kind of gigs are you playing? Uh, we've been doing some headlining stuff, still doing some support slots and, you know, some private things here and there, but it's been good, man. Who's My, booking you? Henry. Glasscock? Yeah. Randy set me up with him, so. I man. love him, though. He's, you know, he calls me once a week and we talk about it. And I knew, I met him when he was promoting shows in the Southeast with Pat. He's been doing it a long time. Yeah, man. So have I. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's been good to me, though, you know? It's been a lot of fun. He's a good dude. He is, and I started working with him right before the whole, you know, world shutting down and everything, so it's good to be, like, back. Because, man, that was really hard on me, you know? Because, I, like, I, I mean, I know it was hard on everybody, but it's, for me, it felt like things were really starting to, you know, the gears were starting to turn a little bit, and then all of a sudden, it's just like, dead. So I had to sort of... It's weird to go from 100 to zero. yeah. And then, and then feel like you're going from zero back to a hundred. So yeah, man, was momentum enough to where it felt like you were picking back up where you started? Or? I think so. Thank God, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't like I had to sort of rebuild everything from the ground up. But of course, I got good buddies and mentors that that have helped me along the way to to make it not uh, not as hard, you know. Yeah. So what have you been doing, like? Record wise, I mean, how many records do you have out? Just two, two small ones are. Uh, uh, the last one I just put out about two, three weeks ago, it's called Faded Memories. But, um, is yeah. My, is it, my song on that one? Yeah, In the Dark's on that song. I love that song. Thanks, man. man. Yeah, that was... Uh, Who'd you do it with? I did it with a, a buddy of mine, Oren Thornton, and uh, he's from Springfield, Missouri, but he lived in Nashville for about, for like 10 or 12 years, and then uh, he moved back to Springfield. But we did all the songs, and in Nashville at the Sound Emporium, and then we cut the vocals in Springfield. So it was cool. So I thought you were doing some stuff with Radney. I was. I did one song with him, and then uh, I did. I played all the acoustic guitar parts on the Randy Rogers Band record that Radney produced. So that's me playing the the acoustic parts. No, but kidding. it was all you know because you know that Radney and I have had a, a a really good relationship. He's mentored me since I was in high school, but I never really knew. It was like the first time that I got to like hang out with him uh, in a studio, you know, because our our relationship was always kind of a from a songwriting standpoint. So I'd send him songs, but hey, man, this bridge is kind of weak, you know. You need to change this, or 
You know, you don't need that verse. You're saying the same thing twice. And so it was always kind of, we were always talking about songs. And I'd never really seen Radney work in a, with a producer hat on. So it was really cool to get to, to see him do that and to see, and to work with Randy too in the band. It was, of course, I was just playing acoustic guitar, so I wouldn't sing anything or, or whatever, but it was, right. it was nice to sort of be in a, be who all was playing on, was it, was it, was it Randy's whole, band? Yeah, Randy's band, the whole band. Ebo was playing guitar. Um, and he's super awesome guitar player. And, um, yeah, it was awesome, man. But again, Radney's just been nothing but great to me and uh, an incredible teacher with songwriting and even just, you know, business things. And how was he when you decided to go the, with uh, Oren? Hey, he didn't mind at all. Cause he was busy, you know, he's busy working on a film and doing all, he's got his hands tied anyway. So I think it didn't bother him at all. Yeah. And I, I plan on working with him at some point in the future anyway. So it won't, uh, I don't think it'll. It'll really matter all that much. So, what clubs are you playing? Like, where are you where are you headlining stuff? Um, this weekend we're playing Green Hall, which will be fun. First time headlining that. Um, That'd uh, be great. Yeah, it's sold out too, which is cool. Um, there you go. You know, it, it's weird because I do like. Well, I guess you're very similar in the sense like you'll do like acoustic things, which I love because you get to tell stories and do them intimate songs. Then when you play the clubs with the band, you kind of have to keep it more up tempo and keep it lively and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's a balance between doing that that sort of thing. I mean, I'll play the Saxon pub just me and my guitar. And that and and that really I think it's important to keep those chops up uh, just going out there with Are the are things like the Saxon selling out for you too? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since I played there, but uh but I think we got something coming coming up there too, but um you know, when you took when you invited me to do the Telluride festival, that was that was Awesome, because playing those theaters is, like I said, so much fun. For mm -hmm. me, you know, because it's you start playing with a band long enough, you start to kind of forget how to do that. Yeah. Or maybe not forget, but you start to get a little bit more uncomfortable. Yeah, you lean on it. You, you, of course. Uh, and so that's something that I'm always trying to to keep, you know, now, to maintain. When I you're suppose. with the band, you play you play all the lead? No, I mean I play I play acoustic half of the half of the set, and then I'll play a, a strat. I play electric guitar. Mm -hmm. Now, man, I know that you're going to laugh when I ask this, but really, how old are you? 26. I had to think about that. 26, yeah. I'm gonna, I guess I'll be 27 pretty soon. Well, the mustache helps you age a little bit. Yeah, you know, you got to keep it a little little scruffy. <laughs> I can't grow anything right. Man, if I could grow a beard, I would, but... Uh, but yeah, no, 26 years old. So you've been doing this since you were a kid. Tell me about your family. Didn't you come from a music family? No, not at all. Oh, you didn't? No, my, my dad's in the cattle business. He's a cattle trader. And uh, they all still live in Del Rio. My older, I got an older brother and a little sister. My older brother does what my dad does. So I'm the only one that plays music. Well, how'd you get into it? Um, I started taking piano lessons when I was like in middle school. And that lasted a couple of years before I kind of got impatient with it. I guess I never liked uh, being told what to do musically. Like, you know, I, I wanted to, like, I got into piano lessons because I wanted to learn how to play, like, Hey Jude and stuff by the yeah. Beatles. You know what I mean? And then where I was doing all the, and the reading was really fun. And, and I'm glad that I had somewhat of a, of a, of an education with it. Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to read much anymore. I'd have to really sit down and decipher what each note was. Yeah. But, um, you know, we were doing kind of more classical pieces, which you traditionally do when you're taking piano lessons and stuff. But I didn't like any of that. It's funny, man. That's how I, when I took a guitar class when I first got to college, I was I ran across the same thing. Like it was a classical guitar class, and I just thought I was going to learn how to play guitar. <laughs> and you know, it was like single note pieces. Yeah, like I, like my piano recital, I, I played the uh, the Godfather. Isn't that funny? Uh, and I was probably like 12 or 13. Guess what I played? What? Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. Um, but you know, that's how I got into music. And then I started, I sort of taught myself how to play guitar. I had a buddy when uh, I was maybe 14 or 15 maybe 16. I can't really remember. I had a buddy that was taking guitar, guitar lessons. And, uh, and then he would sort of come home that day and we'd hang out, you know, that summer. Can we throw this in the trash? And, uh, <laughs> we would hang out and he would sort of teach me what he, 
uh, what he learned that day. So I tell people I kind of had like secondhand guitar lessons because he would go in the mornings and then we'd hang out in the afternoons. And my brother played golf. So during the summers, my parents would drop us off at the at the uh, country club. My brother would go play golf. I'd hang out by the pool or whatever. And my buddy's mom managed the the, the clubhouse or whatever. And right. so he was always dropped off doing it. And he was like, hey, man, check this out. And, you know, he'd, he had like a nylon string classical guitar. And he, he's like, you know, he taught me how to play a G chord. And then I'd learn that. And then he taught me the D and then A. And then we'd, you know, start playing those three chords until we'd figure something yeah. out. Yeah. And then so that's how I started playing music. And then the singing came a little bit later. What, and, it seems like I remember you talking about hanging out with some family that a big music yeah, family. Down. Yeah, so in Del Rio, there's a, a, a family. They're very dear friends of mine. They're called the Rome family. And uh, my buddy Jack and Ethan have a band of their own. They're three brothers. And um, they're, I guess, so their grandfather's, I guess their great uncle, their yeah. grandfather's uh, brother was Blondie Calderon, who played with Ray Price for the majority of his career, played with Willie Nelson. I mean, back in the early '60s, mm-hmm. and um, so, and he was a he was a piano player and and kind of the band leader uh, for for Ray for a long time, and uh, so yeah, there's this big wall of fame at his restaurant. He has a restaurant called Memos, in uh, in, in San Felipe and Del Rio, and uh, yeah, it's it's cool. I mean. A lot of history there. Radney knows Radney knew Blondie when he was alive. Really so well. So were you just like the kid hanging around? I I hung around them a lot because, like I said, I didn't come from a musical family. You know, I didn't. I, I the the idea of jamming with your brothers it was just crazy to me. So I felt like I, you know, I I, I feel like I'm a. It's just, a, you know, I'm such good friends with them. I feel like I was a part of the family too because I could come over and plug my guitar in and jam out with them, and and they always loved it because. Because it's just, you know, music. You New know, blood, too. Exactly. So we did that. And then I, I joined another a band there in Del Rio when we were in high school. And we played, you know, just a bunch of covers and stuff. Did you play golf or sports? No, my brother, again, my brother did. And I was, I played a little bit of golf, but um, but music was my thing, man. I got bit by, you know, by the, by the bug at an early age and I stuck with it. When did you start writing songs? Probably like late in high school. And that was when Radney really kind of came into the picture. I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't even think of, uh, I was playing George Strait songs and Tom Petty songs, and we were, you know, playing at the bars in Del Rio, trying to impress chicks, you know, just like anybody else, right? <laughs> right. It was... Uh, <laughs> I love that juxtaposition. What kind of music you play? Well, it's like George Strait meets Tom Petty. It didn't stop there, <laughs> dude. It didn't stop there. We played Santana. I mean, we played everything. CCR. I mean, we tried to we tried to have one hit song in every every decade and every genre. You know, we played Bob Marley. We played Bob Dylan. We played George Strait. Are there music rooms in Del Rio where you could go, or was it all just cover stuff? Uh, no, man. It was all just cover stuff. I mean, we'd all get paid. You know. 50 bucks a pop at every, every member of the band or whatever. I can't even remember a hundred bucks or something. And, uh, and it was, honestly, we were busy too. Like I remember I saved up enough money to buy like my first Gibson guitar. Cause at the time I was playing a bunch of, I don't, I can't even remember what I was playing, but right. like saving up a couple thousand dollars and buying your own, like your first real guitar. Like that was a big accomplishment for me as a senior in high school or however old I was. I can't really remember, but. So were you the music kid? Like by the time you got out of high school and everybody. Oh yeah. Everybody. I mean, we we, we found your yearbook. Yeah, absolutely. It says musician and actor. Oh, you were in all the plays. Uh, Yeah. I was in theater. I mean, I've always wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be an actor before I got into music. Actually. It's just something I just love ever entertaining people. I guess my family was always, you know, Thanksgiving. I was always doing like, impressions of people and whatever I'd, they'd make me pull out a guitar and sing for them <laughs> i was like the dance monkey dance monkey you know yeah i mean everyone that i've that i've <laughs> met that does what we do was kind of the dance monkey kid and you don't mind it you know you kind of love it my brother i mean my mom tells me a story about my brother i was playing uncle sam in the school whatever the school deal was <laughs> you gotta show me a picture of that. you had the beer and the whole thing. the whole bit <laughs> And, uh, top hat and the whole the thing. top hat, the beard around the ears coming down. I'm a Yankee <laughs> Doodle. <laughs> and my brother, who's four years older than me, looked at my mom there in the crowd. The whole school's there, the assembly. And he looks at her and goes, Why do you make him do that? <laughs> And she's like, he volunteers, man. He loves it. <laughs> he, that's his that's his deal. 
But yeah, was your brother like that with you? Like, what the hell? Uh, no, is he older I mean, brother? The, he's my older brother. They all knew. I mean, they didn't care. And again, you know, what's kind of cool is like my parents, again, none of them played music, so they never got in the way. Yeah. They never told me how to, you know, because they didn't know anything about it. And they saw that I could actually play guitar and do, you know, sing a little bit. And then when I started writing, the songs sucked at first, but then, you know, every once in a while I was writing a good one. Yeah, what so. made you think about writing songs? It was Radney. He, did he see you play or was it family Yeah, so the story goes, this, the story goes, uh, I was, I, I guess I was a junior in high school and uh, one of my teachers, his name's John Wardlaw, very, very dear friend of, uh, of the families and, and my dad. Um, and so it was kind of funny because, because John's a, yeah, he's a funny guy and, and he'd like pick on me, but he, and it, cause he knew my family so well, but he was also a teacher. So when I was in his class, I had to sort of, you know, treat him like a, like a teacher and yes, sir, Mr. Wardlaw. And, and, and then when I was outside, like he'd pick on me and, and anything, but he grew up with Radney. So okay. they were childhood buddies. Okay. So my teacher's childhood buddies with Radney, Radney comes to Del Rio for, I don't know, something and he was uh, doing some kind of charity thing or. Was Radney they, kind of local hero oh yeah yeah del, del rio for sure yeah you know? that's great um so he stopped by the high school and and uh john wardlaw my teacher said hey you know he pulls me out of the hall and he says hey where are you going uh, i was like well i got history class down the hall you know third period or whatever it was and he's like hey well radney is in town he's gonna stop by my classroom so i'm gonna pull you out of class and come you know meet him uh, I was like, oh man, I'd love that. And so I went to the other class down the hall and I'm like patiently waiting to get pulled out of class. And I'm looking at the door. I sat right by the door and never opened. I was thinking I was going to get pulled out and the bell rings and I go back to John Wardlaw's because I thought you told me that I was going to get to meet Radney Foster and now I got to go to lunch or whatever. And I'm like, you know, and uh, Radney was just running late. And right then he like walked in and everything that I'd planned out that I was going to say to him, like when I, when I first met him, like just went out the, out the door. And I just, I didn't, I don't, I was so tongue tied. I didn't even say anything. I felt like a dumbass. And, uh, that was when I first met Radney and he was, and then I, and then I had a chance to redeem myself. I met him a couple times later and, uh, he just kind of asked me like what I wanted to do. And I told him, I was like, I want to do what you do. And he said, well, do you have any of your own songs? I said, no. And he's like, well, you better start writing. Cause you know, doing cover songs is only going to take you so far. And so and did he, he tell you right away the first hundred songs don't yeah, count. Yeah, he told me the first hundred songs don't <laughs> count. And so let's say I met him after my first hundred. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so I did, man. I took that advice to heart, and I, I sat down. And I wrote a hundred of the shittiest songs you probably ever heard. You know, um, and probably then, not, but uh, well, you know, we, I think I've heard so. some pretty bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the next time I ever. I guess it must have been a year later. I was probably a senior in high school by this point, and, and he came back to town to to play a, a gig or something. And um, you know, he asked me, "Hey, did you write a hundred songs?" Like I like I told you, I said, "Yes, sir." He's like, "Are any of them good?" I said, "No, not at all, not a single one." He started laughing. He's like, "Well, yeah, that's the point, you know. The point is to teach you the work ethic and how to how to, what makes a bad song and." I had to avoid those same potholes when you're when you're doing it. So it, it, Radney was the one that got me into it. He was the one that r opened my eyes because I was naive, man. Kind of gave know. you a systematic. I didn't approach. know, and even like I didn't, I didn't. It never dawned on me that uh, that you had to write songs again. Like I, I just played songs, and we, we made a little bit of money playing gigs and stuff. And Radney's like, "No, you need to start writing songs." And then, so by the time I went to college, I, I, I was. You know, I had the songwriter mindset. It's like, man, every everything, every day, I tried to write something, something down. Where'd and you go to school? So I, I did first two years of college at St. Edwards in Austin, and mm -hmm. then and then uh, I transferred over to Belmont when I was a junior. Oh, so you graduated from Belmont? Yeah. So hold on, what what happened to the acting along the way? I kind of started focusing more on the music. And then I did, you know, just because it was easier for me to pick up a guitar and try to write something. It was to go try to to find something to to be in, you know. Right. Uh, I've always thought that about acting, like uh, you know, with songwriting, you don't you, you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you it's okay. Yeah. With acting, you got to get approval, so to speak. 
It is. And again, it's just a lot more convenient. Now, were you in plays in high school? Like, were you, I was, yes. Did you play the lead or did you play the kid? I played the lead on one of them. And I can't even remember the name of the play, to be honest. But uh, it was fun. You know, again, I've always, it's something that now that I've, I've sort of got more of a a foundation, I've got a band that I tour with and I've got, uh, you know, dates in, in the books and stuff. It's, it's something that I want to kind of give a little more time and put a little more effort towards because it's a it's a passion of mine i think it's really cool to, to uh You'd probably be great at it I, thank you I, I i hope so again i mean i've never really had the, the real opportunity to do anything noteworthy but uh hopefully soon you know that'd be really fun for me man it'd be cool to meet somebody like a radney who, who can kind of give you a systematic that would be awesome and Austin's and, a great town for it too, man. I mean, it's just, theater it's, here and, yeah. I mean, it's a, there's so much talent um, when it comes to that and music too. It was uh, it was kind of an interesting. I remember when I moved from Austin to Nashville, it was interesting to kind of the culture the culture shock there was was really. You know, yeah, how did you, sure how that, did you how did you fare at Belmont? I mean, that, those kids. <clears> it was it weird. Seems like they they have a plan. For their oh, future. every yeah, everybody's got a plan. Yeah, and it's the best plan in the world, and it's not going to fail. <laughs> right, you know, everybody does. And so, and, you what know, did you focus on there? Like, what did you study? I was still focusing on writing, really. But what you what, what class did? you Oh, take? I, I I studied. Uh, I got a degree in music business, um, which was cool. Honestly, I, I didn't. You know, and I had I had people that uh, I had friends of mine that were having other majors and people were studying commercial voice, you know, cause they could sing really well and people were getting a degree in songwriting. What a, what a major to have, right? My <laughs> dude, if you, <laughs> which, you know, God bless those people. I'm sure, I'm sure they're doing fine. I hope so. But it, it's that, that, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> You hope they I'm fall not dogging on you. If you got a songwriting degree, you know someone. You have a name in your head. Like we're I've like, got hey, a bunch, Johnny. But it's just like, man, I didn't think I didn't. Again, I had people like Radney teach me to do that kind of stuff. I didn't need anybody to teach me how to write songs. I needed somebody to teach me how to make money in this business so that I could right. keep doing it for the rest of my life. And right. so, um, I'm glad that it worked out the way I did because it's. And I'm glad that I had. Uh, all the basic courses that you got to take. I mean, I, I got that over with in, here in Austin. So when I when I when I uh, transferred over to Belmont, that's like I got to jump in all these really cool music classes. I mean, I took like publishing, took uh, artist management. T tells you like what a manager's supposed to do and what a right. what a bad deal is or whatever contract law. We like we like uh, studied really bad record deals and where they went wrong and where people got screwed over. And then I could copyright. I, could <laughs> you one. I got a couple right here. One of them. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny, Jack. No, but it was cool, man. I mean, I never knew any of that stuff. I just knew how to play a G chord, how to, you know, put something down on a piece of paper. So for, for me to get that, Educate and granted, it's one thing to learn something on a chalkboard and then and then try to apply it to the real world like anything else. Right. So I mean, the the best way to learn something is to go out there and 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 feel it out for yourself. But it was nice to have somewhat of a basic understanding of how the different uh, the different gears in, in the in the music business worked and how. So do you have a publishing deal now? Yes, with Warner Chapel. Yeah. Yeah. Which is awesome, and they're 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 the best publishing company in the world. I mean, they've been so good to me, and uh, I'm very grateful that that I'm working with them. But again, it was going back to the Belmont thing. It was just weird to. It was really cool, but weird to learn all that stuff and then to go out there, and then every. I mean, you think you have an idea of what what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, and it's just completely different, right? It, Still turns out to be a, a launch oh, yeah. and a handshake and a look them in the eye and everything that you you learned in Del Rio is really, I mean, having the knowledge of what it what it is you're talking about is one thing that's perfect, but like you know when you sit down and go, hey, you want to work together? Yeah, all the all the book study kind of goes out the door. Yeah, and it's funny because I, I I never um, 
like I my friends in college were all, especially there in Nashville, they they all did completely different things than what I did. You know, I was the only one that played country songs, and, and they thought were. it was they thought it was like crazy. To them, I was like, how are you doing that? Or how do you sing like that? I was like, well, I don't know. I don't understand how you rap like that. Like, you know, they, they just go, like, I, I, a lot of my friends were like hip hop artists and like R&B artists. And uh, it's just a melting pot of talent. It's are they not like still all, in it? Are they still doing yeah, it? Yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of people still, and you, you, you know, like East Nashville's got a bunch of great like indie rock bands and stuff. You know, people people think it's just all country music and it's, it's no, it's far from far from it. Yeah. It's, there's all kinds of stuff coming out of that town. So it was cool because I never felt any level of competitiveness. It was all my friends. We just were really cool and appreciative of, of uh, what the other person did. You know, this, this is my buddy. He uh, likes to smoke pot and he takes really badass pictures. You know, you ought to do a photo shoot with him. And this is my other friend. And, you know, they're a graphic designer and this is my other friend, he raps and this is my other friend and he makes beats and produces and stuff. And then they were all saying, this is our friend. He sings, you know, Don Williams songs. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? And writes them too, man. And, you know, and that was the thing is like they, they all, everybody, every, and a lot of the people were not from, uh, from the South. And so to them, like they didn't really know, know much about country music, you know, uh, the old, the, the traditional stuff at least. So it was cool, man. It was nice to, to have a group of friends that, uh, you know, could appreciate what you did. So what do you, when you left, like, what do you want? What do you want to do? I mean, besides my, just write songs, like when you, when you picture yourself in 20 years. I mean, I want to, I want to tour. I want to play for people and I want to have a kick-ass band and sing. I love singing, man. I love performing, entertaining. I love country music. I love uh, what I call traditional pop, you know, the Rat Pack, Sinatra stuff. I mean, Sinatra's my hero, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I could, I'd just walk out there on a in a suit and tie and just croon for you all night, you know. And I could see myself maybe doing that, you know, at some point in my life. But but it's 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 complicated, honestly, if I'm being real with it. I mean, because I, I like so many different things, mm -hmm. and it just it, sometimes it feels like there's not enough time in the day to do it all, but. But uh, it's yeah. I just love performing. I love singing. I love uh, I love meeting people, and and that's the crazy thing too. Is now that we're playing shows again. I mean, the the weird part about going out there and headlining something or whatever, and it's just like meeting people after the gig. And like, what blows my mind is like some sometimes people tell you how far they've traveled to come see. Yeah, doesn't that trip you out, man? Yeah, I mean, it I, does. I, think I played at. Uh, I think I was playing at Cheatham Street or something, and this uh, this couple comes up to me after the gig and said, "Hey, we got a table over there. You mind coming and saying hello?" I said, "Not at all. I'd love to." I meet this table, and they all flew in from New York City to Austin and drove to San Marcos to come see me play. And I was like, "Y'all are nuts. Why? Why would y'all do? Like, Why well, you never come to New York City to play?" I was like, "Touche. I got you. Got me there. <laughs> that's fantastic." But man. you know, it's like, and, and that's why I tell my guys, man. I tell my my band. I said, "Man, I don't care how shitty of a day you're having. I don't care what's going on. When you go out there on stage, it's your job. It's our job to 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 smile and to put on the best get you know the pe best performance that you possibly can." And afterwards, I mean, you can go back to being pissed off or upset about whatever it is that pissed you off that day. But I I have no idea, you've got no idea who's out there and where they came from or why they're there or what song you wrote moves them in some kind of way. I mean, to them, that's their, and they spent their hard-earned money on it, man. And yeah. that that was something that you've, you've been doing this longer than I have, and I'm sure you've had thousands of experiences like that. But that's something new to me, man, that I'm, I'm still, it trips me out. I'm like, God, you know, I, I would have I would have been so mad at myself had I had I just not been in the right headspace, and I would have put on a bad performance, and then find that out that you know this whole table flew in from God knows Can where. You, imagine? you know, yeah. And so it's I I have to remind myself that because you know it is a job, and sometimes you're not you know sometimes you don't feel good or your voice is kind of not in the right spot, and just whatever and you got to play this gig but uh you got to go out there and do your best to kick ass every night well, that's where those acting chops come into play. right smile act like you're having a good time <laughs> i heard a story one time about joe dimaggio and he was he was down in the minor leagues 
because you know nursing an injury or something and, and he was running out every ground ball and running out every every first base you know diving for shit and one of the guys who was a kind of a career minor leaguer was like what why do you why are you doing this man you're gonna be in the big leagues next week no matter what and he said the same thing he's like yep. man some kid out there is the first time they've ever seen the great Joe DiMaggio play. <laughs> I'm giving him a show. <laughs> like I gotta, I gotta be Joe DiMaggio every day. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, it's part of, it's part of the job. So do you think, you know, like Radney had success on, on the radio, but it's a different world now. Like I had success on the radio to, to jumpstart the next part of your career. But what what does that look like for for a twenty six year old kid, man? Man, like, it's uh, do you have to have that kind of exposure, or what? Do you- man, it, you know, honestly, it feels like it's uh, you know, it's a lot of social media presence. You know, it's absolutely crucial and necessary. You know, and it's got its perks, and it's got its its you know bad things about it too. But uh. You know, TikTok is really, really big right now, um, which is cool, man. I mean, it's like a giant billboard, honestly. It's a giant marketing, and it's free, too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not always the, the funnest thing to do, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a way to get yourself out there. And so I've been doing that whenever I got some free time, do that. I just play cover songs, play some of your songs. Is that what you do? I do, you know, and, and um, that platform specifically, I've sort of realize that humor is a very big part of it. So if there's any way to incorporate something funny about it or, or uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's times where um, I'll take a song, I'll take a song that's not country at all and just kind of make a real country spin on it and uh, and people seem to freak out. You know, it's funny or whatever. Um, <laughs> just yeah. hearing you say that cracks me up. I mean, yeah, man, there's this Talking one- about being funny. Yeah, it's I hard. Mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's the, you know, that song, uh, "Get Low" by Lil John. To the window, to the walls. But if you take a guitar, you're like, to the window, to the wall, yeah. till the sweat drips down my balls. <laughs> People are like, what? You know, you take a song like that that everybody knows and you make it super country and like it's just you spin something on its head like that and that's the stuff that really kind of pops off on that. Right. I did that. You know what's the funny the funny part about that thing is uh I played uh I would do that just like as a party shtick, you know, just to get a rise out of people. Yeah. I'd sing that song. To the window, to the wall. <laughs> Somebody was recording me one time. I said, Hey man, don't delete that. Like don't put that up anywhere. You know, I'm just goofing off and it's the songs you know inappropriate i don't want you putting that out there you're like man oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, you know and they deleted it whatever and the next day i think i was playing the nutty brown opening up for parker mccollum and we were on his bus and i was doing the same thing i was singing that song and he thought it was the funniest thing he's like hey dude let me record that i was like all right but don't put it <laughs> don't put it on instagram he's like all right all right i won't i promise and so i sing this little john song and of course, Parker's like, dude, I really want to post this. I was like, you know what? Screw it. Like, you got a hell of a lot of followers, so I'm sure I'll I'll gain some from it. And uh, and so he did. And then he tagged Lil John, and then Lil John reposted the thing, and the thing like blew up. So like, really, yeah, there's still people at my gigs that tell me to play it. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna play. That <laughs> That's your biggest hit. I mean, yeah, right, yeah. I peaked out too early, but you know, you put that kind of stuff. Going back to the TikTok thing, you put that kind of stuff out there. It's just really, it's funny. It's funny. It's something right. you've never seen before. Right. And, so uh, that's a big way that artists nowadays try to get their name out there. Um, of course, all the other platforms too. But yeah, but where does your crooning <clears throat> desire? You know, all these things that you have in your head that you want to do. Mm-hmm. Does that all fit under who you are as an artist, or do you feel like you don't want to confuse people? It's hard not to. But it does fit. I mean, to me, it does because I can do those things. You know, I mean, that's a, a, I can sit, you know, I sing Sinatra songs. Right. I love singing George Strait songs. I love writing songs that are kind of in those veins or whatever. But, uh, but you know, it's hard. You know, sometimes you do have to stick to a certain thing. And if it's, especially if it starts working, 
Right. You know, if that's what people want. Well, this is anyway. working. Well, you know, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's going really, it, it is, it's going great. But, um, but yeah, like I, I have conversations with, with, you know, people like Randy or, or people on my team. I'm like, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. And they're like, Hey, chill out. Why don't you just focus on one thing at a time? I was like, I understand that, but there's so, only so much time in the day to try to do well, it. It's also coming this. from people that haven't seen you do it. Yeah. Or that's, that's, and when people try to put limitations on you like that, it kind of speaks more to, to, to their fears than yours. It, yeah. It's, you know, I think that, uh, I think there is a balance there because I think that people can only take so many, but it, look at people, um, you know, look at the Beatles and how they evolved over the years. Well, yeah. You know, Cause it's, the, the, it's about you being yeah. authentic no matter or, what. Yeah, exactly. How'd you meet Randy? I played a, I played an award show in Arlington. It was the, uh, the radio award show that they do every year. Mm-hmm. And I got a chance to sing a song at the at the uh, actual event, and uh, he was there. Him and Wade, and um, who else was there? Fowler was there. I'm trying to think. Anyway, so I sang one song, and it went over really well. And afterwards, I was oh, I was talking to somebody. What song was it? Uh, a song is a traditional country song of mine called Bourbon Whiskey, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I sang that song and the crowd loved it and it was I, I felt really confident in the in the performance and and I thought it went over well. So uh I sang that one song, got off stage and uh you know who else was there? It was Randy Travis. He was on the he was in the wings and uh to talk to him and his wife was really 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 cool. And I remember kind of like singing like no pressure, you know. Uh it's just on the side of, you know, in the wings looking at you. And uh <laughs> Randy, uh, Randy Rogers came up to me after the gig. He's like, dude, hey. And I told him, hey, man, I'm a huge fan of yours. He's like, well, dude, I came here to tell you we're drinking beer on my tour bus. If you want to come up and drink a beer and hang out, I'd like to get to know you. And I said, absolutely. So I went up on, a, on his bus and we drank beer for a couple hours. And gave me a guitar. He made me sing all kinds of songs. Made me sing songs in Spanish, too. Because yeah. he asked me if I sang in Spanish. I said, I do, yeah. And so I sang a song in Spanish. He's like, sing another one. I sang another one. Sing another one. I sang another one. So, you know, I was playing my songs, cover songs, Spanish songs. And, and yeah, that we, ever since then, we've been really good buddies. He's like a big brother to me, you know? Yeah. Um, Does he still manage you? No, he did. He did there for a while. But his management company, ever, you know, COVID kind of threw things for a, for a loop. And um, I think when, when that happened, everybody was just trying to focus on on their own careers. And I think Randy's big, biggest priority was getting the Randy Rogers band back, back to work and that sort right. of thing. So they kind of put that on, on hold. And I had to, I had to move over and find new management, but who manages you now? Red light management. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm grateful for, for the opportunity to work with him. You know, so you're in the full on Warner Chapel music publishing, red light management. W- Who's putting w- at your records? I'm putting my records out still independently. How's that going to change? Or do you want it to? I would at some point. Um, and that's, I mean, dude, it's a, it's, that's the ultimate question, man, is finding out, finding out who to partner with, who to sign with. and Are there people knocking? A few. A few. I still think I'm a little, I don't know. I mean, it's different for everybody, man. And, and I know that you know that it's, it's, everybody's got their own path and it's, it's different, especially being Texans, you know, and having what we have down here and, and, uh, that foundation and the infrastructure to build a career here. It's different compared to people my age who are trying to, who are trying to do it and build it from the ground up, up in Nashville, you know? Well, and it's so, also different for you, man. Cause in, I don't allow false humility here. So like it's different for you. A lot of guys from Texas or from anywhere really, but they got to go out and prove they can get an audience. They got to prove all of the, the touring stuff so that they bring something to the table. Yeah. Which it's interesting. It's always interesting to talk to someone like you, who you, you bring talent to the table. Thank you, man. Like, you know, like you bring the only thing that's really needed you have. So as a lot of your heroes or a lot of people that you kind of looked up to, 
they had to hustle a little. Like, I mean, you have to hustle yeah. too, but yeah. like, absolutely, it's different when you open your mouth and you sound like you do. Thank you, man. Because you know, the, and the and the songs you write are already fully fully realized. Thank you. That that means a lot. Well, it's just the truth. So. Yeah, and and right now is the time, in my mind, to where wanting to do those different things is the time to do it now because you can because you can you can do so many different things. Yeah, talent wise, and you have the energy and the the breath to to be able to try a lot of different things on, and no harm, no foul and if they don't work. Exactly, and if they don't work, it's fine, man. Because people's attention span is so fast. You cover it up with whatever you do next. Yeah. People, you know, again, going to the uh, to the social media thing. I mean, now, now, you know what's crazy, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's because I'm just making assumptions. But it seems like when you were an artist um, before social media was a thing, there was something cool about the about being mysterious and that people, you know, the, 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 the star factor, right. You know, when you walked into a room and everybody knew who you were and then you just like that, you kind of were gone. Right. Mm -hmm. and nobody knew really too much about you. And that was cool. Now it's kind of the opposite. Now they encourage artists to be as open with their audience. And it's almost like your audience kind of wants to know what you, you know, they want to see what, what your real life is like. And they want to see they want to see the girls without makeup because they're like, oh, wow, they're just like us too. Wow. Like, uh, you know, they kind of gravitate towards that and it's compelling in some sort of weird way. Yeah. And so, you know, there's something, I think that vulnerability is really, really attractive to a lot of, a lot of well, the Well, is it fans. attractive to you? I don't mind it because if anything, I, I, if anything, it's, it's kind of like, you don't have to put up with the bullshit of like having like put yourself together and like act like, you know, you're, you know, like have to walk into like you know you can be yourself and people love that you know and and like even mega superstars are doing that too you know, like people like Bieber and stuff like that I mean they, they they'll go live and it's like yeah this is my living room whatever welcome to my house kind of a thing and so yeah. I think with that being said going to what you were saying is like yeah you know you can you, I can tell people too say hey you know I sing country music but I also like singing these kinds of you know, come Christmas time, I'm going to sing a little Sinatra Christmas song <laughs> yeah. because I can and I want to. And, you know, if you don't like it, it doesn't really matter because I do. So. Well, you're, you, the, like I said, going back to the talent thing, it's funny to, for you to talk about it can be, can be, can come across a, a different way than you just doing it. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, you, you know. You, you, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Somebody who's through, like, well, I like keep it country, man, or what? Like if people have these purest kind of thoughts but then talking about do. it which of course they do, do until they see it and it's pure ah, right yeah and they go oh i would have never put those those together but if you just go do it then nobody's you know, gonna argue yeah, the it. proof is in the pudding You're yeah absolutely it's like right. telling somebody you tap dance might look a whole lot different in their head than them watching you tap right. dance <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it, it is an interesting thought to like, I'm curious when, when you, um, like before social media, you being an artist, what would, like, what was that? What were the differences between then and now? Because I'm curious if, if my, if I'm right or wrong. You're, or ex you're exactly right. And it's hard for guys like, like me to go. Cause man, I still, I don't care what Mick Jagger had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he had some chick yeah. dancing around. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to know the, who, you know, that he ha has spotted underwear. Right. You know, I mean, so that's always been appealing to me. You know, I remember watching Johnny Cash walk into a party one time and, and it was just like, was like these people had this aura around and you could them. you feel the, exactly the air change. And so, or like Prince, you know, like he walked into a room, room owned it. You never knew what he, where you never knew where he was coming from, where yeah. he was going to go. And more and people just like talk that, about like him that. when he's gone than when exactly. he was there. It's like, and there, exactly. there is a thing to that. And I still, I, I still think that you can do both, but just like you're saying, like you doing stuff on social media, that's you. Yes. It, that's the most important thing. What, whatever, I mean, whatever platform it is, I, I just think. 
that the, that the mystique comes from the talent. And, and when you, and when you lay something down that may be off the wall, but it's for real, that only adds the mystique. If, and if you're doing shit just to be funny, it usually comes off as, Oh, he's trying yeah, to be funny. Yeah. It's a stick or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But when you're just real with it, yeah, then that's but, what it is, you know? But you know, that being said, I still don't really give a shit what Mick Jagger <laughs> does in his off time. I like the, the last year when he was going on tour, which is badass. I went and saw that the Stones really? on tour. That blows my mind, dude. But before that, like a year before, they showed him dancing in his studio. I remember that, and I didn't like it. Really? I mean, I love him, and I thought it was cool that he's doing it. You just didn't like them putting that kind of. Content I want to see there. him on stage yeah. dancing like that. For real. Yeah, just go out there and <laughs> do it. No, no, no. no I totally understand what you're saying. Um, like that being behind the curtain too much to me is, and I mean, I struggle with it. Again, man, that's the, where do you draw the line? And it's different for everybody because some people, they want you to know everything about their personal lives. And then- And sometimes you know, that works. Sometimes it works. Depending on the fans too. I mean, what, what their fans are like. It's just an interesting, it's an interesting thought though, because- because like, you know, you got management telling you, I'm, I'm serious these days. Oh, well, you need a certain amount of personal posts and then certain amount of, uh, okay, personal posts. Like what? Like, you know, a picture with your nephew or something like, oh yeah, okay, sure. You know, and that, and that's the truth. Not that I don't love putting that kind of content out there because it is me and it's my life and it's something that I, lo yeah, I it's love. Cool. And, but th there's a, the fact that there's an algorithm to it is what kind of bothers me, you know. That the, well, it's, it's, always, it's like I feel like I'm doing the piano lessons again. Like I don't want you to tell me what I want. I want to do whatever the fuck I want to do. Like I'm, you know, I, it, it does. You know what I'm saying? Struggle's real. I mean that kind of, that kind of shit is real. I it's just like, want to play Hey Jude right on the piano. <laughs> Shut up and let me play Hey Not Jude. Not the Godfather. <laughs> Not Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pay money to see that, man. <laughs> You got to have it somewhere. I got to have it somewhere. Miss Little was my teacher. She fired me because I didn't practice. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to come to this Colorado in a couple of weeks. I'm excited about it, man. I love Telluride so much. I've already been, I've, you know, it's probably, this will be my maybe fourth fourth time going. Radney's going to be there. I know. I'm excited. Have you ever, have you ever hung out with Chris Knight? No, I have not. I'm a, I'm, He's great. Okay. I'm excited. Don't be him. scared. No, I'm trying not to. That's one thing I've really loved about you from the beginning. You're you're not scared of people. I try not to. Uh, every, every once in a while, somebody will kind of freak me out. But uh, when you're a big fan of somebody's, but you know that's the cool that's the coolest part about what we get to do is it's very uh, it's easier than you think to end up in a room with somebody that you've looked up to your entire life, and uh, when that happens, you just have to. Uh, just treat them like a normal person, like anybody else would want to be treated. And if you get the chance to to show your appreciation for them, uh, then go for it. But uh, I always just try to smile and not talk too much, you know. That's how I first met you. Well, I don't know when we first met exactly, but for me, it was at Horseshoe Bay. Yeah, we were at that. I played that, that show, bar. and yeah, you came up after, and you were so forthright, and I thought you were kidding at first. <laughs> I thought you were like, like, who the hell is this kid? <laughs> but you know, you're just forthright. Hey, yeah. Man. And that was before, um, I mean, I guess that was before, like I'd really gotten to be real tight with Randy. So at the time I remember, I mean, I think that, uh, Radney was the real, only real person I knew in the business. And, and, and I, I remember what I was doing there in town. I was playing this really, uh, weird gig at um oh what's that uh, golf course there um escondido escondido i was playing there in the in the clubhouse and uh or there at the bar honestly but you know it's one of those things where they you find a lot of hundred dollar bills in the tip jar so you you you, you play whatever <laughs> it is that they ask you to play but it, you know it was, that's what i was doing there and i was staying they got me a hotel room and i just Decided to have a little nightcap at the at the bar, and y'all walked in. Yeah, but again, I mean, I didn't bother you. I, didn't, or I tried not to. I just you didn't you know, bother me at all. But it did make went, an impression. I said hello and mentioned Radney and I's relationship and whatever, and then I kind of dipped out. But yeah, you know, the, the one that was that I've uh, 
it was like really, really hard to keep cool with uh, George Strait whenever, whenever, because he does that thing at his golf course every right. year. And it's a great cause. And I'm glad that they invite me, uh, they keep inviting me back. But he's just the cool, he's like just the king of cool, dude. I bet like, he loves you. Man, I, well, and you know, he, the fact that he'll show up and he knows my name and that's, that's awesome. But again, you just got to, I couldn't imagine, man, like being, being somebody who's who 99.9% .9 of the strangers that they meet just have bug eyes and just super starstruck and you know what I mean? And, and, oh, yeah. and, and so I try to avoid doing that kind of stuff or ever, you know, my mom, bless her heart. She's like, every time I tell her I'm hanging out with somebody or whatever, she's like, did you get a picture? I was like, no, I couldn't prove it if I tried, you know, I didn't get a picture. I'm not going to ask these people for a picture, you know, but, <laughs> but I hung out with them. We drank, drank a beer or whatever. And, yeah. and then you just kind of learn that etiquette, I suppose. You yeah. know, you know, uh, sorry, I, I'm not to go down the list of every like, Super, I'm just when you meet one of your heroes or when you're in the same room as them, it, it really kind of freaks you out. But you you ever been to Arnold's Country Kitchen right off of Eighth in Nashville? Yeah, it's one of my favorite restaurants ever. Yeah. And I tell this story on stage all the time. But John Prine would be there all the time. I mean, he'd probably eat there three times a week. But so would I. So I would see him all the time. I mean, I must have seen him tw twenty different times, and he. would walk in by himself. Uh, you always knew when he was there because he had this, the coolest like old black Cadillac with gold rims. And, uh, and sometimes I'd walk in the place, he'd already be there. Sometimes I'd be there first and you'd see him walk in always by himself. And he'd just read the newspaper and eat meatloaf or whatever was on the menu that day. And he'd sit in a corner booth and he would just sit there and nobody would ever talk to him. Nobody would ever go up to him. I think it was su such a nonchalant thing at that point because he'd been doing that for probably decades at that point, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just moved to Nashville and, uh, you know, uh, it just blew my mind that John Prine just <laughs> eats lunch by himself three times a week, whatever. And then there I was on the opposite side of the place by myself eating lunch by myself, just probably creepily staring at him, you know, but you know, and did then, you ever get the, I mean, gumption? I held the door open for him one time. I said hello to him a couple different times, but it wasn't ever major, you know, he wouldn't know me from, you know, if he saw me, but, but, uh, so when he passed away, it really kind of hit me hard. Cause like, God, like, I felt like I, I never bothered him or anything, but I felt like I knew him, you know, I felt like we were the two weirdos that, that, you know, hung out in the corner booths by themselves and just you were you know well, yeah you know what i'm saying <laughs> are, it's just yeah. like i felt like we had that that Kindred thing there spirit. yeah and so but it, it again going back to to the to that it's just it's 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 good to be respectful to people and 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 let them well it's know. good to have that kind of respect and it shows up in your music it shows up in your personal life as far as i can tell it's like just the fact that you hold just as much reverence for George Strait. Yeah. As, as, in the same breath as John Prine. So where pe music people know, know that those are very similar, but you know, you go out on the street and as huge as John Prine is right. to us, um, you know, 95% of the people who love George Strait don't know. Uh, right. That, that one of the, one of George's, one of their favorite songs is a John Prine yeah. song. I want to dance with you. <laughs> yeah. Twirl you all around the floor. That's what they intended. Dancing for. That's a good one. Yeah. Christofferson, though, you're buddies with him. Like that, don't, don't you have that same sort of, uh, or I guess you're probably, no, I, would, you, I would assume that you're, you know, past the point. No, you don't ever get past that. You know, I was telling somebody the other day that there, you know, there's, there's always that moment where, where it's like, where you go, we're cool. Holy shit. This is really like, this is, this is really happening. I'm sitting here talking to Chris I'm sitting here talking, I'm sitting here writing a song with Guy Clark. Yeah. Whoever I could it not is. Have imag I could not imagine. And it's just always the same. It's that thing where you take a beat yep. and you realize how blessed you are, how grateful you are to be there, how lucky you must be. And then you, and then you get back into your life. Yeah. Cause that, that kind of melts away. Well, yeah. Cause it's like, that's, that's, 
if you're if you're not ready to play in the NFL, you're probably not yeah, on a team. Absolutely, that's a very valid <laughs> point. So, like, if you're there, you deserve to be there, and you work for it. You know, that's that's what I mean about talent. B- being the leader of the day is like, yeah. no matter what, man, you could, you're not going to be in the room with those people unless you're supposed to be, and that's that's where you got to give it up to your higher power, to your God, whatever whatever it is, and go. I'm here. I could be somewhere be else. Be very grateful too. Yeah, yeah. that's that's one thing. My my parents make sure that uh, they remind me all the time is to is to be grateful for the uh, for the opportunities, man. Um, because not everybody, you know, there's always people that would kill to have the things that you have. That's well, you and I both me. know that there's a lot of talented people. Yes, I mean, way more talented than than. I can't say then us, but like just really, really talented that don't mm-hmm. have the opportunities and don't, for whatever reason, don't end up in the same room as, as the people that we're looking to be with. So. Absolutely. And there's people, you know. And then there's no talent. Fucks. I was about to say that and I stopped <laughs> myself. I was about to say, and then there's people that you're like, how in the hell? That son of a bitch sucks. I could do that. <laughs> No, no, yeah. Well, man, it's funny. I, here we are on the from the front end of your career, and you know, I can't wait to see where I can't wait to hear the record of you crooning. Thank you, man. I can't wait to hear. I love. I just love what you do and how you do it. Thank you very much. Um, it really it, it means a lot, man. Coming from you, I mean, I, I'm I'm excited too, and I'm, it, it's it's so. Again, man, it's just a blessing to be able to go out there and people are showing up to the gigs. I mean, that's all very new to me. Um, because before before I was actually playing and headlining stuff, I mean, I was just playing little coffee shops and smoky rundown bars, you know, which is good. You, everybody's got to start there, you know, so that you can appreciate it once you... That's right. Once you're not doing it anymore, but... Uh, and some uh, people never go back, except for the after party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dude one of the funniest <laughs> stories that i love that you tell is the story of blaine's pub in san angelo texas because yeah, that, that just reminded me of that you know oh blaine oh blaine's man um god that's a, such a good story but yeah yes yeah, it's, it's nice to be uh to feel like the hard work that you're putting in is is paying off and there's still a lot of work to be done and there's still a lot of things that you know everybody wants to accomplish but uh it's it's good man to to feel very um at peace and content with the way things are going and that's kind of how i feel lately well it feels that way being with you hey i'll see you in a couple weeks and tell you ride thank you jack thanks for being here man dude thank you for having me man and uh continue onward with grace man thank you you're fantastic thank you so much how we do Thank you.